I think around 32, 33 years old. Another, um, let's just say a moment of clarity occurred. And the nice thing about this moment of clarity, the beauty of it, was that it had no experiential byproduct at the moment it happened, which was very different from any other kind of, let's say, spiritual experience or realization. They all seemed, they were all often had some energetic, emotional qualities that, you know, were very, which, which actually makes it a little harder to really zero in, in on exactly the kernel of the truth, you know. But so this unfolding happened and there was, abs there was really no emotion with it all. So it was just a pure scene, just a pure scene. No emotion, no high, no low, no left, no right, just a scene. So, in this scene, we could call it an experience, but only if you think of an experience without experiential qualities. In this scene, the first thing that was seen was in the sound of a bird, hearing the sound of a bird outside, a question arose not from my mind, but from my gut. And I mean, literally, you can feel where the, where the energy of a question comes from. Usually they come from your mind, but this one, literally, I could feel it come up from my gut and into my mind. And this question just asked, who hears this sound? And as soon as the question was asked, the seeing was given. As soon as the question was asked, then there was just the, the bird, the sound, the listening were all one happening. There wasn't actually a who to hear the sound. It was all one event. Sound, hearing, bird, one thing, one event. Not this thing where we usually feel like I am hearing this or I am noticing that one <laughs> event. So once again, this happened when I sat down to meditate. It sat down as soon as I sat down to meditate though. It happened before I even started to meditate, which is always instructive. I always found anything really useful that happened for me always happened right when I sat down to meditate, but before I actually started to meditate in that gap, right? Before you start to try to do something, you just sit down and say, oh, wait a minute, okay. So of course I, you know, I, I hopped up and like thought I'm gonna test this. So I started looking at the most common objects to see if this same scene was true. And you know, knowing me, of course, if people actually get to know me, you would, I, I like, it just was, I just thought, what is the most ordinary thing I could check this out with? And I thought, I'm going to go look at the toilet. <laughs> so I go into the bathroom and I look at the toilet. And sure enough, toilet, scene, thing, same. I'll be damned. <laughs> Next thought I have is, well, what else can I look at? So I went to the stove. You know, most people would like go out to nature or something. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm like going to the stove. OK, there's a stove. OK, same thing. And then I look around the trees, and da, 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 so it goes on. And then walking, you know, just walking across the floor a minute or a couple minutes after this happened, walking across the floor, then that, that scene disappeared. Everything disappeared like into a void. Just disappeared into a void. The whole oneness thing, the whole unity thing, the whole I am that thing, everything just disappeared into, into a void. A 
coming out of that void, which I have no, how, I have no idea how long I was in the void, in that void. But come, I mean, it was literally I was walking across the living room, which at the time, me and Mukti lived in a 450 square foot cottage. The first six and a half years of our marriage, you damn well better get along if you're in a 450 square, square foot cottage. The living room meant the living room was the family room. The living room was the kitchen. The living room was pretty much the whole place. So I'm walking across the living room and this whole little void thing happens. And how can we say this? And the next thing I know, I'm looking down at my feet, and it's like being a, um, you know, if you ever look like at a really young infant, when they get totally enamored with something, like they just pick something up and it's like amazing, or, you know, when they can spot themselves in the mirror and they recognize it and they're like, ooh. Well, and they just can just stare at it forever. You know, there's that, you can feel in their energy, there's a sense of absolute newness for them. So there I am walking across the floor, and I felt like a baby, like an infant, because each step was like, had never been taken before. It was like the first step, as if one was born in that instant, and you'd never actually stepped on the earth ever before. And so each step was like this. So I, big, so I actually started walking, just kind of walking back and forth. And like a kid, like a little infant would, like, ooh, wow, that's really wild. Foot, floor, do, 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 you know, all this stuff. So so even then, after, and then I, and then I um, packed up and went off and drove to work. <laughs> and and I used to for years I used to call it my birthday because that's what it felt like it felt like being born like actually being born so it felt like it felt more like more like a real birthday than my birthday birthday um, which is curious because the whole thing kind of happened on um, St. Patrick's Day and I had less than a year before me and Mukti had gotten married and her and her whole clan are Irish to the core. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. I don't even care. But I think it's a wild synchronicity that, you know, the mind sometimes can't grab. I can't really grasp all these things if they have any meaning at all. But anyway, a year later after that on St. Patrick's Day, once again. In the ensuing year, by the way, still there was something... that occasionally would try to grasp at parts of that experience. At times, and other times not. But the intuition, that voice had told me, just kept reminding me, don't grasp. Don't cling. Don't look back. Don't try to recreate. Don't just let go of all that. It's easier said than done, isn't it? It's a lot easier said than done. As many of you know, when you have any quality of deep spiritual realization, it's very difficult not to grasp, not to try to hold, and not to try to recreate. You know. So I had this, this voice that was always reminding me, don't do that, don't grasp, don't try to recreate, don't do that. But some aspect at times would still kind of grasp in a small way, not in these like this desperate grasping, but in a small way. Now the advantage I had through all this is that from the time I was, from the time I can remember, um, my mother had always told me, had always sort of mirrored back to me how weird I was. <laughs> it was a real blessing. It was a blessing because she had this catchphrase she used to use all the time and she'd just say, weird is wonderful. And she'd like kind of dance around the kitchen and she'd sing to me saying, weird is wonderful, weird is wonderful. You know, <laughs> You're like, yeah, Ma, you should know. <laughs> but, you know, what a gift. What a gift. I, 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 I would like, 
I would like always to somehow impart that gift to any and everybody because it was such a gift. Because in our own way, everybody deep down in some some place knows how weird they are. You know, <laughs> everybody's pretty weird when you get to know them. Um, and the weirdness is, of course, what makes everybody quite amazing and unique and fascinating. Do you know? We just put so much energy into trying not to be weird. But So I was lucky that I had this mantra from the time I was very, very young, weird is wonderful. So as a lot of you know, when different spiritual shifts happen, your perspective changes, then your relationship with life is different. It starts to change, does it not? In your way you relate with life and what draws you and what doesn't draw you and what, what, what pulls you in as a way of interest, what what bonds you, what becomes the sustaining fabric of friendship or romantic relationships or your work life or your relationship with all of that undergoes transformation. And that transformation is often, it's strange because, you know, awakening does not come with a set of instructions, right? It's just like, here's the new perspective. Now figure out how to be that way. And, you know, it doesn't say, okay, here's how to do it. But as, as the more clear we get, the, the less inclined we are to collude with illusion. Because we see colluding with illusion, number one, just isn't any fun. It's not interesting at a certain point. Right? In the ego land of ego, colluding with illusion is what we do. It is what bonds us together. We do collude with each other's illusions. Right? That's... That's how we bond. Like I said, we bond a lot through pain and suffering more than through happiness and joy, but nonetheless. So there's a lot of ways that we move in the world that have to be re-examined, a new way to be in relationship with your human life. No one can tell you how to do this. There's not a right way to do this. Each person you kind of find your way with it in the same way that, you know, um, water finds its way down the side of a mountain as a river. You know, the river doesn't just like examine it from afar and go, okay, now we're coming up and we sh this water should turn right here because there's a boulder and it should. It's not a decision thing. It just, it has a natural way of finding its way and its rhythm. And as our consciousness starts to shift, and first, what we're confronted with is that we, we have a different vision often than, than the world is, than we have reflected back to us from the world. We have a different vision, and so we have a different way of being in the world, and yet there's very few ways in which we can even get touchstones of how a new way to be is going to look. And eventually, when you stop trying to do it right, and you stop trying to figure it out, and you stop trying so much, you find that this actually is kind of like water going down the side of a mountain. There is something about clarity that finds its way, finds its way, finds its, its rhythm, finds its pattern, finds its way of being in the world, finds its way of being in relationship with people and places and things and events. And... You, each person has to find that for themselves. It's a, it's a quiet, intuitive thing that um, one discovers bit by bit by themselves. So I, I said I was lucky in the sense that I had this mantra that I was given to, by my mother very young, weird is wonderful. So when these things, these are kind of weird things happening. And it can, make, it can make you feel kind of weird in the world. But I was already like, I was already established in that. So weird was fine with me. You know, not, not, not knowing exactly how everything fits in was totally fine. It was okay. I had a long time ago knew that, you know, the more you try to make things fit, fit together and fit in and figure it out, the more confused you make yourself. So you just relax, let it be weird, let it be strange, let it be unknown, and there's a way that spirit finds its way. Right? So that, that I was lucky because I've seen as 
when I teach is a lot of people do have their certain kind of struggles with adapting to a, a different vision, right? A different quality of vision. They have because most mostly because the mind's trying to figure out how to do it. The more you just kind of relax, it finds its own way. So as I said, about a year, uh, literally a year to the day after that, on a year from uh, St. Patrick's Day, a year later, I was sitting on the sofa in the same room. I was reading a book. I think it was a book by Krishnamurti. I have no idea what I was reading about or anything. I can't really come up with any relationship with what ha may have happened when I was reading. Um, but I re was just reading the book, and I folded the book, it was time, and I just thought, I'm going to get up, and I put the book down, and I stood up. And I noticed when I stood up that, strange as this may sound, when I stood up, something didn't stand up with me. I knew that. I felt it. And I thought to myself, now, what didn't stand up? I know I left something behind on that couch, but I don't know what I left behind. What is it that didn't stand up? So that was kind of curious. I could, I, but I absolutely knew something didn't stand up. Something stayed there or disappeared or whatever you want to call it. And so it was just kind of as a sort of a mild curiosity. And so when I went to bed, when it was time to go to bed that night, I sat down on the edge of bed, you know, just about ready to roll over and pull the covers over me. I sat down on the edge of the bed and then it hit me. I left myself on the couch. That's what I left on the couch. I'll be damned. I left myself on the couch. Hmm. Now, you can't tell someone what that even means. I mean, it's one of those things that's completely unexplainable for the most part. Because we usually mistake self for ego. And self and ego are actually two different things. Self is much more fundamental than ego. It's one of the first, not the first things they develop, but one of the things children develop rather young, about a year and a half to two years old, something like that, sometimes younger, is when they develop the ability to see, to, to, to register themselves, to know that when they're looking in the mirror, that it's them that they're seeing. So it happens relatively young. So there's this, there's this, there's this, capacity to this reflex that notices, oh, that thing in that mirror, that's me. If you put a baby in front of the mirror that's six, year, six months old, they have no idea that what they're seeing in the mirror is anything other than everything else in the mirror. There's no sense of self. There's no sense of anything. Everything is just completely undifferentiated. And that's one of the beautiful things about an infant is they don't have a self, you know. They'll develop one pretty soon and quickly, and then mommy and daddy will try to deal with that for the rest of their life. <laughs> so, of course, I didn't know what the hell that meant. Because it's not something you find very often in sort of the spiritual literature. All the spiritual literature is about like things I've described so far, and much more than I've described the spiritual literature. You know, there's like union, and there's bliss, and finding what's eternal, and what never comes or goes, and what doesn't die, and, and I could go on seeing yourself in everything, seeing God in everything, and, you know, union with God, or whatever. All, there's all these qualities of experience. They're talked about in spiritual literature. It's, it's the stuff that most people are chasing. It's what they want to happen. Um, but getting up from that couch was definitely none of that. It was actually the ultimate non-experience. It was kind of like standing up out of experience. So you can't say it, put it with any quality. There was no quality. There was no yahoo. 
it wasn't even necessarily an insight at all. It took, like I said, it took me till that evening to just recognize what, what had actually occurred. Now the interesting thing about it is with the loss of self. And this, can, this starts happening way before the event that I'm talking about. It starts happening in our spiritual lives much earlier too, but it happens in a com to complete way, in a total way. With loss of self, what you lose, it's, it's much more describable by what you lose and what you gain. What you lose is any relationship with the divine. In fact, you lose the divine. You lose any experience you have of the divine or of God. You lose it all. You lose, if you have union, you lose union. Union disappears. Uh, me and God are one. Disappears. It's the hardest part of it to explain, but so, and I'm not even going to really try to explain it that much. But only, only in like retrospect, only in after the fact, do we realize that every experience up till that point was the self's experience of something. The, one, the self's experience of life, the self's experience of others, the self-experience, and then there's the self's experience of the divine, the self's experience of God, the, one's self's experience of unity, whatever. And that's why up until a certain point, when we have these kind of experiences, which are very profound and transformative, there's usually some element of self that grasps at them, that wants them, that ask, how do I get that back? How do I maintain that? That's, that's self, right? I had this point, I had this experience where I wasn't there and life just flowed beautifully. How do I get that back? See, the complete contradiction in the question, isn't there? But most of us at some point ask those kind of questions within ourselves when we have these profound moments because we have many moments of experiencing life without a self, without even kind of knowing that that's what's happening. What we know is only when self kind of reappears that it was really good when it was gone. It wasn't really good in the sense you were having some huge wild experience because it's only self that has huge and wild experiences. Without the self, there is no more huge and wild spiritual experiences. If that's what you want, don't let it go that far. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I often say that the, the deepest impulse in us towards reality, God, sacred, however you think about it, but the deepest spiritual impulse we have in us is an irrational impulse because it literally takes us beyond ourself. And it's this, which is, when we hear that, what we usually think of some sort of representation in our mind and our memory where, where we can remember of, of us experiencing something that's beyond ourself. But we are still experiencing it, you see. So we think that to have something beyond yourself is something that somehow yourself experiences, but it's not really true. To be beyond yourself actually means to be without self, without this self-reflecting mechanism. And I, everybody in this room knows this self-reflecting mechanism, this U-turn in consciousness that's always reflect, referencing itself. How do I feel? Good day, bad day. Do I like it? Do I not like it? Is it good for me? Is it not good for me? I like this. I don't like this. I want more of that. I don't want more of that. And it's, all, it's, this U, it's literally this U-turn in consciousness that's always looking back instantaneously into its own image of itself and asking itself, what do you think about what's happening? It happens instantaneously and almost entirely unconsciously. All that most you notice is the effect. So we're almost always referencing, how do I feel about what's happening? What do I think about what's happening? What's my, 
What's my judgment about what's happening? All these are the ways we reference self. Now, as I said, one of the things that's the underlying hallmark of true spirituality is self rarely, even in my case, like, getting up from the couch, you could say self stayed on the couch. But for many, many years, there was a dropping, there was a falling away, a dissolving of self. It was the thing that was happening underneath all of my spiritual life. I didn't even, without me even knowing that it was happening. It was sort of subterranean, do you know? And there are hallmarks of you losing your scent, yourself there are hallmarks of it along the way. Like I said, it changes your relationship with life. Even if you lose bits and pieces of yourself, it changes the way you move through life. Um, like, well, I think one of the most common and initial parts of just sort of starting to not have oneself be such a big part of your experience um, is you just know the, the taste and the appetite for the dreary dramatics of ego just sort of starts to ebb out of you, which is different from a resistance. Like, I don't want that. I'm tired of listening about, I'm tired of listening to that. I just, that's, that's a denial. That's a, that's self, that's, self-centeredness actually but it's just sort of an ebbing away a disappearing a dissolving of just the interest in it like it just doesn't compute doesn't make any sense anymore right and that's when you start to notice that if you continue to engage from an egoic perspective you're actually colluding with certain illusions and of course the self in people and the ego in people they want you to collude with their illusions. Right? Deeply underneath, they do not. Because the truth is in everybody. But on the surface, self and ego actually desires this sort of collusion. Right? That's why we often form into groups. Because then we can collude with each other's illusions. Right? <laughs> we agree on the illusion. <laughs> And our illusions are different from their illusions. But we don't call them illusions, do we? <laughs> My truth is different from their. They're stupid. I'm smart. You know, that kind of nonsense. So there is hallmarks of the, the, the often kind of slow diminishing and dropping away of self. And it's actually the dropping away of self that really is accounts for your sort of constantly changing and evolving relationship with life. And it's getting more and more and more and more less self-centered. That makes sense. It just happens that way. It just gets more and more and more meaning less and less and less. <laughs> centered on self. So I'm not using self-centeredness in a moralistic way or a way of a lack of virtue. I'm using self-centeredness just in a factual way, lack of centering on self. And as, you, as your self diminishes, or if it completely falls, bas falls away, basically, it often, it really plays havoc with your mind, usually for quite a while. Even if parts of yourself fall away, it plays havoc with your mind. So if you're younger, you'll wonder, am I going crazy? Am I going nuts? And if you're old, you'll probably be, if you're older, you'll probably start asking yourself, am I going senile? <laughs> you know? Because one of the most common hallmarks is it really plays with your memory. It really screws your memory up, usually, for, for years. You know? And you're like, why can't I remember what I did two minutes ago? So the young per you know, per person that's like, you know, 50, 60, 70, I must, maybe I'm going see now, good Lord. And someone that's young going, maybe I'm going crazy. Am I going to end up in the, you know, psych ward? Jeez. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of actual changes in the way your brain functions because you're literally, your brain structure is remolding itself. 
It's having literally to fit to a different vision of, of life, of what's real. And it doesn't do that instantaneously. It, it literally re rewires itself. I'm absolutely convinced if somebody would, could act, would wire somebody up and, why, and could just take continuous, you know, viewing of the brain and how it's functioning and how it's firing, that they would, they would absolutely see that the brain was restructuring how it works and how it fires and the synapses and everything gets changed. I went for a number of years literally feeling like there was some, remember those, the switchboards? They used to have, you know, where they plug, then they plug. I felt like there was some, some switchboard operator in my brain that was just going, well, okay, that, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it really can play with the way your mind works. Overall, though, as this rewiring happens, what often occurs is the brain, the mind becomes much, much, much clearer, much sharper. By sharp, I don't necessarily mean that you gain IQ points, <laughs> that you become more intelligent, but there becomes a clarity of mind and a clarity of vision. Now this falling away of self, like I said, for most people it happens quite gradually and often over a long period of time. And we often, at least nowadays, because there's so much talk of non-duality and no self and all that, you know, there's no doer and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's all well, well and good. The problem is, is that the more accurate a teaching is, the more harmful it is potentially, because it's close to truth. No teaching is truth. Nothing that can be said is what's true. So the closer you get to what is true, the easier it is to mistake the statements about what's true for what actually is true. And that's the danger of, 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 a, of a good, accurate spiritual teaching. You know, it's, it's actually very prone to misinterpretation. If that makes sense. Um, being able to have clarity about these matters is sort of a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because there can be clarity. It's a curse because you can explain things with a clarity that somebody goes, oh yeah, I get it. And they may not actually get it at all. What they get is what you say, but they may not be getting actually the place that you say it from. They may be getting the place you say it from, but they may not. So it's kind of a kind of a danger. The, th the reason I'm talking about this, like I said, is not to explain my personal narrative, even though I have up to a certain point. Um, and the reason that I was hesitant and often met, I often share bits and pieces of my life because I think it makes it a lot less abstract for people. And I usually share things that help humanize me in people's minds because that's always a good thing. Um, but the danger of it and the hesitation of sharing, especially one sort of personal narrative, is that we hear it and our mind starts to seek after what we hear. It starts to try to duplicate what we hear. The problem with that is, again, is that each person's unfolding is very, very unique to them. Yes, there is the underlying things we come to see have a unity to them, have, there's an agreement. You know, if, if someone's actually experienced union, where yourself is in union with the, with the divine, which is often mistaked as there's no self, but it's not, it's just, it's union. Once, if you've had that, you talk to somebody else who's had it, you know, you, you understand each other. How you got there, exactly how that unfolded, exactly how that was shown to you will be very, very different. So it's like the end thing is similar, but how you get there is, is very different. So the, the danger of sharing a personal narrative or anybody's narrative of their spiritual unfolding is that great tendency of mind to try to either duplicate it or worse than that is to compare. Where am I in relationship to that? 
And of course, that's what self does. That's one of the ways it references itself. Where am I in relationship to this? You know, that self always wants to know where is it in relationship to whatever, right? You turn on the news. Where am I in relationship to the news? Do I agree with it? Do I like it? Should that have happened? Shouldn't that have happened? Who's right? Who's wrong? Are the lefties right or are the righties right? It's always, you know, trying to check in. Where, where am I in relationship to everything? Because the one thing that self does not want to happen at all cost is to lose itself. And that's why in this retreat, as you have seen and you have heard, when we when one starts to get glimpses of what lies beyond self generally for most people those glimpses scare the hell out of them because what lies beyond self is seen by self it's an absolute blank void that's what it is from the viewpoint of oneself of self What's beyond self is completely and absolutely unknowable. There is no capacity or ability to know even the slightest thing about what's beyond self. The self has no capacity whatsoever to know anything about what's beyond self. So when it starts to bump up against what is beyond self, the only relationship it can have with that is an absolute void terrifying often from a lot of people, terrifying, scary, void, a void in which most people will come upon quite a few times before self lets, lets itself go. Most people, they'll come upon the void any number of times before self lets go. And that's the way it is. So when self doesn't let go, it's not because you've done something wrong. And when self does let go, it's not because you did anything right. It's just a timing thing. It's just sort of a maturity thing. You just come up upon it. But as we've seen at this retreat, it's why for a lot of people, fear is a is part of their is a deep of a part of deep spirituality because we bump up into this infinite void one can even really let go into it and then yourself can sort of recreate itself even after that and then it really gets scared because then it really knew that it wasn't there and so that's <laughs> that's even kind of more frightening than never having really gone dissolved into the void, it's having dissolved into the void, and then the self kind of reconstitutes itself and goes, good Lord, I wasn't there. I was absent. And there's that void still there. But curiously enough, you also have this weird memory of like, and that was so amazing. That was, that's what one's drawn to, like a moth to a flame. So it's this push, push, pull, pull relationship with nothingness, nothingness, no experience, no self, no union, no, no God. Godhead, yes, no God in the sense, no more personal relationship with God. Does that make sense? Like I said, when I was 25 and there was, I discovered that eternalness. I didn't know exactly what it was. I knew it was me. I knew it was what people call God. I knew it was what the Buddhists call Buddha nature. I knew that. I knew it, but I didn't know. I didn't really know. I, all those are words that refer to something, right? What does God refer to? What does Buddha nature refer to? What does the divine refer to? What do these terms refer to? I knew I was experiencing what they refer to, but I wasn't totally clear on that. So what I was left with, with I still had self, but self knowing that the divine was always there and always present and was its own essential being. But self was still there. 
That's why the journey continued, because self was still there. And that's usually, generally, some version of that is the way it goes. Rarely does self really just the first time around just completely let itself go. It's very, very rare. It happens, but it's quite, quite rare. <laughs>